Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us here today at the Sunshine Cathedral via the website. And we want to welcome you to our worship services whenever you're in the Fort Lauderdale area. If you are in the area, we invite you to worship with us on Sunday mornings at 9 and 1030 a.m. We're located at 1480 Southwest 9th Avenue. And for those who watch us weekly on the internet, we invite you to check our website often for other listings and programming that we might have that may be of interest to you. And for now, I invite you to come in and worship with us here at the Sunshine Cathedral. My friends, please join me in the spirit of prayer. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy names. Amen. Amen. from the wisdom of the Psalter. Blessed are those who consider the poor. The Lord delivers them in the day of trouble. God sustains them on their sickbed. In their illness, you heal all their infirmities. In these human words, God's voice is heard. second reading is from the Gospel according to Luke. There was a rich man who dressed in purple garments and fine linen and dined sumptuously each day. And lying at his door was a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who would gladly have eaten his fill of the scraps that fell from the rich man's table. Dogs even used to come and lick his sores. When the poor man died, he was carried away by angels to the bosom of Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried, and from the netherworld where he was in torment, he raised his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he cried out, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am suffering. Abraham replied, My child, remember that you have received what was good during your lifetime, while Lazarus likewise received what was bad. But now he is comforted here, whereas you are tormented. 
Moreover, between us and you, a great chasm is established to prevent anyone from crossing who might wish to go from our side to yours or from your side to ours. He said, then I beg you, send him to my family's house, for I have five siblings so that he may warn them, lest they too come to this place of torment. But Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets, let them listen to them. He said, oh no, Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Then Abraham said, if they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone should rise from the dead. In these human words, God's voice is heard. Please join me in the spirit of prayer. May God's word be spoken. May only God's word be heard. Amen. Well, this is sort of, uh, the gospel reading today is uh, sort of tough at f uh, uh, first glance because we think we know what it says before we hear it, which makes it hard to hear it. We think that somehow this is a story about someone going to heaven and someone else not making it. And that is not what this story is about. In fact, what is uh, wonderful about the story is that the only person specifically named for not being forever in the presence of God, the only person singled out is an unnamed person in a made-up parable. And so this whole idea that there is this torture chamber reserved for mostly people we don't like, because surely, you know, our family and friends, they're going to make it, right? But so this afterlife torture chamber for, for people we don't like and this afterlife country club for the people we do like, that's not in this story. This story is part of a larger story. It is a parable. These are characters. They, they, these are not historical uh, people. It is a parable meant to make a point, and the point isn't to sell you fire insurance for the next life. That's not what it is. It's part of a larger narrative that Luke is really very good at weaving. Luke begins his gospel by saying that he's actually done some research. He's been looking into these matters. He's heard the stories. He's met some of the people. He's been trying to, to figure out this gospel business and then write his own account of it. And he gets so excited about it. He gets so passionate about it. He gets so creative about it that he writes two books. It's a two-volume set, the, the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. And when we look at those two together, it is a big story that includes us. It starts out with Jesus' family, and then Jesus uh, comes along, and then Jesus' ministry, and then Jesus getting in trouble because his ministry was about giving people freedom and liberation and hope and empowerment, and those things aren't valued in imperial systems, and so the empire doesn't love that, and so Jesus gets in trouble, and he is arrested for sedition, and he is tried, and he is convicted, and he is executed, but wait, there's more. And so somehow there is this experience called resurrection. Somehow his execution didn't end his story. And so there is this resurrection experience followed by ascension, fo followed by Jesus being embraced in the bosom of Abraham. But wait, there's more. From that experience, the Spirit of Christ returns. 
and enlivens the church to be the returned and resurrected body of Christ on earth to continue the mission of healing and teaching and gathering community and empowering and uplifting people. And that's the rest then of the book of Acts. And so the story is the Jesus story, and we're part of it. We are meant to be a continuation of the story of bringing hope and healing to people's lives. So that is the large context of the good news according to Luke. And throughout this meta-narrative, throughout this big story that includes us, this big story, he hammers a particular theme over and over and over again. And if we will remember that theme, then today's story in Luke 16 makes sense. If we will start in Luke 1, we hear the Magnificat. We hear Mary singing, God has looked upon this handmaiden's lowliness, and from now on, all ages shall call me blessed. God has thrown down the rulers from their thrones, but lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry with good things and has sent the rich empty away. This is chapter 1. Way before we get to chapter 16, Luke is already talking about turning societal norms upside down, turning the values of empire upside down. From the beginning, Luke is saying, in the kingdom of God, in the non-empire of God, in the counter-kingdom of God, the last are first, and the first are last. That everyone has sacred value, that everyone is important, that everyone's needs are to be met, that every person is loved unconditionally, and that's from the beginning. God has looked upon this handmaiden's lowliness, and from now on, I will be called blessed. But that's just chapter 1. In chapter 2, we see Mary. She is now great with child. That means she is way pregnant. She is great with child and is on the road. She and Joseph are on the road. So they are, they are in a different place. They are travelers. They are foreigners. They are in a different place. They are refugees, or they will become so uh, shortly. And so here this temporarily homeless, traveling refugee family it's time to be delivered. It's time to have the baby. Nobody has any room for them. I refuse to believe that nobody had any room for them, right? But they, they're the other. They're the outsider. They're these homeless travelers that we don't know anything about. And so nobody had any room for them except one person says, well, I've got this barn. If you don't mind using a feeding trough for your cradle, if you don't mind having your baby in a, in a filthy barn, you can have that. And so that is where Jesus is born. Now, who comes to celebrate this event, right? The rich, the powerful, the city officials? No, shepherds, people who work hard for a living on the low end of the totem pole. And these people who work and live outdoors are the ones to come and bring comfort and encouragement and celebration to the event. But also there are angels. That while this is a difficult time, and only the least and the lowly seem to be taking care of each other, the angels are present. That's important. Then in Luke chapter 6, there's the Sermon on the Plain. Matthew calls it the Sermon on the Mount. He has it on a mountain. Luke has it in this plain. And in the Sermon on the, on the Plain, Jesus says, Blessed are the poor. And blessed are the hungry. Remember, Lazarus is poor and hungry. Blessed are the poor, and blessed are the hungry, and blessed are those who weep. And then, now in Matthew's Sermon on the Mount, it's just bless, bless, bless. Luke adds something else. Luke says, bless, 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 and then he says, whoa, whoa, whoa. Woe to those who were not compassionate. Woe to those who were not generous. Woe to those who who could have made a difference and just couldn't be bothered. Then in Luke chapter 10, what do we see? We see the good Samaritan. The good Samaritan. The people hearing that story would have been amazed to learn there was such a thing as a good Samaritan. But the good people, the priests, the Levite, the temple aristocracy, the good people 
They didn't help the person in need. They're walking by and they see someone who could be dead. They're not going to touch a dead person and be contaminated so they can't enter the temple. This is their moment. This is, this is their vacation. They're not going to ruin their vacation. They're going to ruin their pilgrimage. They're not going to ruin their special event by touching some dead guy and then being impure. So they just keep walking. In fact, they cross the street. They don't want to accidentally even trip over this corpse. But the Samaritan said, well, let me check to see if I, there's a pulse. He might not be a corpse. And sure enough, he wasn't a corpse. And the Samaritan, the person who practiced another religion, who lived in another uh, uh, country, who lived from another region, this other, this, this from a group that was constantly demonized, it is the Samaritan who stops and does the human thing. Is this person in need? And how can I help? And then with his own generosity, saves that person's life. It too is a parable, but a powerful one. Then in Luke 19, Zacchaeus, who is a tax collector, oh, and they, they were shady, the tax collectors. They were shady. They would line their own pockets. They would charge more than was fair and then keep it as sort of a commission. People hated the tax collectors. But when Zacchaeus has this, uh, takes this fearless moral inventory and he wants to be a different sort of person, he promises Jesus, I will give half my wealth to the poor. I will be generous. I will take care of the people who are hurting. Then in Luke 21, we see Jesus praising a widow who has almost nothing, but she gives what she can. She gives what she has. Just two little coins worth almost nothing, but they were all she had. And so we see this widow practicing extreme generosity in her context, and Jesus paying attention to the poor, doing what they can. In Acts chapter 1, verse 18, Judas who, of course, has betrayed Jesus and, and got a payoff for it. In, in, Luke's, in Act, uh, Luke's version in Acts, he buys property with his money, but then has a tragic accident and dies, never gets to enjoy his property, never gets to enjoy the fruit of his ill-gotten gain. And then in Acts chapter 20, Jesus is remembered as saying, it is more blessed to give than to receive. This is a constant theme. In this narrative about the kingdom of God, the non-kingdom of God, the anti-empire of God, in, the, in God's economy, how this is supposed to work is we all have sacred value. No one gets left out. And whenever anyone is in trouble, when any, anyone is hurting, whenever anyone is suffering, we aren't supposed to vilify them. We're not supposed to judge them. We're not supposed to say, you deserve your misery. We're supposed to be the healing hands of God offering them comfort. We're supposed to be the conduits through which the grace of God flows to offer them hope. This is the good news that Luke offers. To the hurting, the good news is help is on the way. And to those who are able, the good news is you have been chosen to be the means by which help is on the way. That's Luke and Acts. And so when we remember that, the story of this rich man and this poor man is just one more example of that. The rich man doesn't pay attention to those in need, doesn't use his privilege to make other people's lives more comfortable, doesn't use his wealth to help those who have nothing do better. And so his legacy is rather hellish. His legacy is he is not remembered as being generous, as being part of the solution. And so he isn't remembered fondly, but the one who suffered, the one that God wanted him to help Lazarus, Lazarus who's only received compassion from dogs. Dogs come and lick him to try to make him feel better, but no one else notices him, but God notices. And so Lazarus winds up in the bosom of Abraham. Martin Luther said the bosom of Abraham is the word of God. So Lazarus is forever embraced in the word of hope, the word of love, the word of liberation. That is what today's story is about. It's not about who's in and who's out. It's about in God's kingdom, no one is out, and we aren't being true to our calling as followers of Jesus when we act as if someone is out. And so this isn't about, yay, Lazarus gets a, finally gets a good break. This isn't about what you have to believe to be okay in the end. This is about when we see people being vilified for how they identify, for the gender that they understand themselves to be, it is our job to offer advocacy, not to ignore it or add to the pain. 
thing. When we see people being vilified and demonized and dehumanized for their sexual orientation, our job isn't to ignore it or to add to their sorrow. Our job is to advocate for them and say they are God's miracle and not God's mistake. When we see the poor, we aren't to say, what can we do that might make you even poorer? Because that would be good politics. No, we're supposed to say, what can we do to eliminate poverty in our midst? When we see the sick and hurting... When we see the sick and hurting desperately fighting to have access to care so that more than dogs will take care of their wounds, we are meant to fight like hell to make sure they don't lose their access to good coverage. This isn't about heaven and hell for those who believe certain things. This is about our job of trying to transform hell on earth into something a bit more heavenly. That is Luke's understanding of Jesus' message. And so again, to those who are hurting, the message is help is on the way. And to those who have some resources, the message is you are how help is on the way. And this is the good news. Amen. And now, may God bless us and keep us. May God's face shine upon us and be gracious to us. May God look upon us kindly and grant us peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us today here at the Sunshine Cathedral. If you're ever in the Fort Lauderdale area, we invite you to stop by and worship with us on Sunday mornings at 9 and 10.30 a.m. If you'd like to make a donation to the Sunshine Cathedral, or if you'd like to find out other resources that the cathedral has to offer, please visit us at www.sunshinecathedral.org. Until the next time, we look forward to seeing you here at the Sunshine Cathedral.